Dave Palumbo with another RX Muscle Rant brought to you by Redcon One. Today's topic, IGF-1. You know, a lot of people are confused, first of all, about what IGF-1 actually is. So I'm going to explain that to start with. And then I'm going to explain the difference between IGF-1 and long R3 IGF-1. Because that's where I think the huge, huge disconnect occurs. A lot of people don't understand about dosing the, the two different products. And I'm going to explain to you why there is a different dosing regimen for them. Now, IGF-1 stands for Insulin Like Growth Factor 1. Uh, the reason they call it that is because it has an insulin-like effect in the sense that it can drop blood sugar. Insulin's job is to push you know, glucose, push amino acids into the muscle cells uh, and store them okay, as you know, to produce new muscle tissue, uh, to repair muscle tissue, to store glucose as glycogen inside the muscles and the liver, to feed the brain cells. Okay? Uh, IGF-1 has a similar effect to that, but that's not the main reason it's produced. The liver produces IGF-1 in response to growth hormone. So when GH, or growth hormone, is released from the pituitary gland, or you inject it exogenously, either one, your liver will break that GH down and release IGF-1. IGF-1 will then go to its receptor which in, in most cases occurs when muscle has been damaged. So if the tissue has been damaged in the body, it increases, the muscle tissue will increase its uh, receptor affinity and increase the receptor numbers for IGF-1. IGF-1 will then find those receptors, bind to them, and then initiate repair of the muscle tissue. Okay, IGF-1 also has what we call a, uh, a satellite cell or stem cell differentiating effect. It turns these stem cells into new muscle tissue, uh, something that steroids don't do. So IGF-1 has all these great uh, things going on in the body, and so people naturally felt, well, if we were taking GH, why can't we take IGF-1? Now, when the initial IGF-1 studies were being done, they realized that when you take IGF-1, it only stays in the body for a very short period of time, maybe only 20 minutes before the body degrades it and breaks it down. So for bodybuilding or muscle building purposes, or, or for whatever purposes they, they designed the IGF-1 for, they found that if they can make it stay around longer, okay, that would be better. Now, what actually makes the IGF you know, stop working? Well, there's something called IGF-1 binding proteins. These, these uh, float in the bloodstream, okay, with everything else, and when they see IGF-1 in a free form, because you just injected it, okay, these binding proteins grab the IGF-1 and inactivate it very quickly. So they figured, these scientists, if we can create an IGF-1 molecule that has added side groups on it, add, added chemical groups that will actually block the, uh, or, or disguise the IGF molecule so that the binding proteins don't recognize it, the IGF-1 can last longer in the body. And they came out with, the first version they came out with, which was, which was called DES IGF-1, DES IGF-1. You've heard that probably, you know, for sale or seen it for sale or heard about it. Uh, it worked okay, but they then considered and refined the process and they discovered another, you know, uh, I guess you could say modified IGF-1 molecule called long R3 IGF-1. It's three side groups on it and they found that that particular molecule will avoid binding protein you know, inactivation for at least almost up to 20 hours. So that's going to give you a lot more life on this molecule. And so it's going to do a lot more muscle repair and growth and you can take it once a day and it's going to work really well. Um, so bodybuilders started using it. As a matter of fact, I started using it myself in 1995. I might have been one of the few people to, to actually get the real long R3 IGF-1 back then. There really was no peptide sites and there was no internet or anything like that. And I found it worked really well. But the longer I used it, I, and I've told this story before, it stopped working as well. Also, the, 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 the more I took of it, the quicker it stopped working. So I realized is that if you take too much IGF-1 or for too long a period of time, the receptors for it downgrade. They don't respond to it. And that's just a protective mechanism the body has so it doesn't grow too much. And that's, you know, while as bodybuilders we would love that to happen, but the body doesn't want to do that. So I created a protocol for long R3 uh, IGF-1 where you would take it for four weeks in a row and you would stop for four weeks and you would never raise the dosage over 20 to, you know, 10 to 20 micrograms per day. Um, now you bring in the advent of the internet and peptide websites and guys are getting long R3 IGF-1 really cheap, one milligram. They're using 100 you know, micrograms a day. Some people are using you know, even a whole bottle every day, 1,000 micrograms of it a day. Obviously, you get no benefit of it. Now, what you will notice is you'll still get that insulin-like effect because IGF-1, even if it doesn't have 
IGF-1 receptors to bind to, it still can bind to insulin receptors. And the more you take of it, the more it will bind to these insulin receptors and lower blood sugar. Uh, a lot of the side effects people got from taking long R3 IGF-1 were, was low blood sugar, um, cramping too, because it seems to lower potassium levels, I found, or maybe even some sodium levels. I think it was, it was more of a potassium effect, because when I would take potassium supplements with it, um, I seemed to be better. Um, so there are some side effects of long R3 IGF-1, uh, once again, uh, it, it is a dose-dependent type of thing, but most people, I think, have learned, at least from my educational videos, or you know, maybe they haven't, I don't know, that less is better with that. But then the, the, the drug administration, Food and Drug Administration, came out with their own version of IGF-1 because, hey, let's face it, this pharmaceutical company's got to make money off this, right? They don't want anyone else taking their, their thunder. Uh, once again, for, for kids who uh, were, I guess, considered pituitary dwarfs, they weren't growing enough, they were giving these kids growth hormone therapy. The problem with giving growth hormone in high dosages is it makes you insulin resistant. So it can screw up your blood sugar. So they found it, they figured, well, you know, it's not the growth hormone that's making these kids grow. It's the actual IGF-1 component that's being released from the liver. What if we just give these kids IGF-1? Now, long R3, for some reason, was not an option when they created this drug. They created a pure form of IGF-1 uh, just that looks just like the regular version that our human bodies produce. The difference is that, you know, our human bodies constantly pulse this stuff all day long. Uh, so I don't know what the dosing protocols for, for pituitary dwarfs were with IGF-1, but I would assume it was much higher okay, dosage, dosages than what we take for long R3 IGF-1. Now the, the question or the question that may come up is, well, why? Why, is the, why do you get 10 milligrams okay, of IGF-1 when you buy Incrilex, or for, even some of them come as 40 milligrams? And, you know, the, the dosing is, like, is, is in milligrams, not even micrograms. It's, 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 it's tremendous amounts. If, IGF, if long R3 IGF-1, a typical dosage is 10 to 20 micrograms, and an Incrilex IGF-1, without minus the, the, the R3, long R3 side group, is in the, almost in the milligram dosage, why is that? I mean, why, why, would that not continue, why would that continue to work? That would be the question, especially if I'm telling you that it stops working because it gets inactivated. Well, here's why. When you take regular IGF-1, it doesn't, it, you, it doesn't avoid, it avoid the binding proteins. The binding proteins grab it and deactivate it quickly. So while you're taking you know, higher amounts of it and you're getting a quick surge of, of growth from it, it's not lasting all day long. So from a bodybuilding standpoint, that's not really desirable. From a long bone growth standpoint, it's very desirable because when the long bones have the, their receptors for IGF-1 and they get blasted with a, a large amount of it, it stimulates those bone receptors to start growing, okay? And then if the IGF gets deactivated right after that, who cares? The, the, the effect has already taken place. Um, so my suggestion is that bodybuilders who get the Incrilex form of IGF-1, which is not the long R3 version, if you're gonna use it, you're better off microdosing it all day long, taking small amounts of it, maybe 40 micrograms, you know, three, four times a day, as a, or even 20 or 10 micrograms three to four times a day because you don't have to worry about receptor downgrade to it because it doesn't last that long in your system and you'll get a much better effect from it, I believe. Now, once again, all this is speculation because no one has designed bodybuilding, you know, the only people who are designing bodybuilding protocols for drugs are bodybuilders, you know. I, I you know, I just, I designed my R, long R3 protocol based on my own personal, you know, results with it when I took it back in, in the 90s. And that was less was better, and you can't use it consistently. You should do four weeks on, two weeks off, four weeks on, two weeks off. And that just seemed to work well, and people got good results with it, myself included. With the, uh, the Incrilex form of it, the pharmaceutical grade, if you can access it, it's very expensive. So most people are not even using it. It's not even relevant. You want to take micro doses, probably, like I said, three to four times a day in small amounts, okay, spread out every couple hours. And see how that works. And I would probably still do that on a maybe a four week on, two week off, you know, cycle. Because if you take anything too long, you're going to stop responding to it. Uh, but the difference is the length of time that the IGF-1 is present in the bloodstream. When it's in there for long periods of time, like you get in long R3 IGF-1, you're going to receptor your receptors are going to downgrade very rapidly because they're constantly being exposed to it. When when it's not in the body more than 20 minutes. When you take it, even if you're microdosing three or four times a day, you're not going to downgrade your IGF receptors because that's more of a natural, you know, uh, effect. Also, something that a lot of people don't realize is that in the periphery, in, you know, in your actual muscle cells, 
Okay, muscle tissue. Let's say I, I do a set of forearms and I break down some forearm muscles. I am going to get a, not only, I'm going to get a local release of IGF-1. It's called mechano growth factor, MGF. You've probably heard of that. Mechano meaning in response to the mechanics of what's going on. So you're damaging something mechanically. It's releasing very, very, very small amounts of local acting IGF-1 that help with the initial repair. That's additive to what you see systemically when your liver releases IGF-1 to also come to this site and repair it as well. So in our bodies, we actually have two forms of IGF-1, one called IGF-1 and one's called mechano growth factor. They're both IGF-1s, one's local acting, one is more of a systemic acting hormone. Now, a lot of people for a while were injecting the MGF too, and they're still available on some of these peptide websites, but it doesn't do anything because you, you can inject it locally, but it doesn't stay there, it goes into the bloodstream. The way it, in, in your body naturally, your body is trickling it out in very small amounts over a couple of hours. So it's constantly being flooding that area. So it's a different phenomenon. So it's very hard sometimes to mimic the effects of nature uh, in a bottle. Okay? Easy with steroids because steroids are long acting compounds. Even with GH, it's, it's not bad, okay? Because of, of the effectiveness of the way it works. But when you're talking about taking insulin or you're talking about talking, I, taking IGF 1, you have to really be very precise the way you take it and very analytical and you have to understand what's going on in the body so that you can make the right decisions based on what you're using. All right, guys. I know that was a very complex topic. You might have to watch this a few times to get the full gist of it, um, but hopefully this kind of differentiates long R3 IGF-1 from regular IGF-1 and it maybe gives you some clarity in your mind moving forward which product you might want to use. I'm Dave Palumbo with another RX Muscle Rant brought to you by Redcon One. We'll see you next time.